Thanks for joining. Um, as Diane suggested, the topic of the discussion today is uh, sustainable directions in the waste and waste management industry. A uh, pretty prominent and pretty relevant topic compared considering uh, what has been happening in the industry. Uh, before I get started, I really want to start off with a quote that is uh, that resonates with our topic uh, and kind of puts it in a broader view of, uh, of uh, sustainability. Uh, this is actually a quote by Dr. Guy McPherson. Uh, what it says is, if you really think economy is more important than environment, try holding your breath while you're counting your money. Uh, so <laughs> that kind of you know, puts everything in, in perspective here and what we're talking about. Uh, we are in the middle of a crisis, uh, climate change, water, global water crisis, landfills and oceans filling up. But the good news is we have experts who have been working towards it, uh, you know, all through the time and, and in, in uh, different industries. But right now the need of the hour is take it to a bigger scale. Um, so in that context, SCS, has decided that we'll bring in some of the experts who uh, work through this industry, work uh, are, are, are uh, in the middle, of, in the midst of this, and hopefully help us out with certain ideas, thoughts, um, and you know, put sustainability in the right direction. To start off with, I really want to introduce, uh, take an opportunity to introduce the panel here. We have uh, Bob Watts. He is the executive director for Chester County Solid Waste Authority. Um, he has been involved in this industry for, I don't know, three decades, four decades now, been working towards solid waste, uh, recycling, landfill management, and landfill gas management. Um, he is also heavily involved in SWANA. He's the keynote uh, chapter uh, member, and he has also um, served as an international board member. Outside of his professional thing, I do want to highlight, and he was uh, he shared this with me, saying that his recent ski trip included a helicopter skiing in British Columbia. I would love to add that to my uh, list, Bob, but I'm sure that's that's a great uh, experience you had. Uh, in addition to that, we have Jesus Jesus Torres. He is the division manager for Republic Services. Uh, he leads uh, some of the development of sustainable waste reduction solutions in uh, Southern California. Um, with his leadership and with his overall view, uh, Republic operations and engineers, you know, they stay ahead. They kind of figure out what the solutions, whether it is compliance, regulations, things as such. Um, we also have Tim Flanagan, who is part of SCS and also part of SWANA. Um, he is, I would say at this point, about four decades of experience in uh, landfill management and waste, solid waste. Um, um, he has uh, extensive experience and again, in you know, a part of SWANA, he's been leading this, um, including various industries, various locations, various uh, uh, strategic locations and industries. Um, and we also have Pat, Pat Sullivan. He is the senior VP at SES. And uh, he has been involved with SES for 30, 35 years now. But uh, his focus is more on sustainable solid waste management, greenhouse gas emissions, and uh, various different elements related to sustainability. That's the introduction. Without further ado, I want to hand this over to Bob um, so he can share his experience and background and we can continue on uh, with any um, discussions around it. Bob, over to you. Thank you. And uh, I've been here 23 years, Chester County Solid Waste Authority, and now this sign indicates the second name change since I've been here. Originally, we were the Lanchester Landfill, Lanchester Sanitary Landfill. And then uh, the board decided to drop the word sanitary some years ago. And now we work through um, bringing us more up to date to reflect some of the things we do. And we settled on, on these, this name and, and this logo. We are um, 
about a thousand ton a day landfill and uh, about a hundred tons a day of alternate daily cover. And this is, uh, we're in Southeastern Pennsylvania, a little map for us. First thing I wanted to highlight, uh, this is uh, just a, over a year old. This is a relatively small solar project, but it's on the oldest landfill. This landfill was closed up in 1976, and it's about 300 kilowatts AC. And it was sized in the kind of the top left-hand corner. You can just see one of our leachate storage tanks. We have a um, reverse osmosis high pressure system to treat our leachate. And this, this uh, array was sized to, to run that facility, which, which it has done. It hasn't been without its glitches. And I wanted to say, I have a, another slide on the leachate treatments plant. And this picture was taken by uh, Chris Taves, our facility engineer. Now, this uh, slide represents one of our, our projects that we have included. This is our third <clears throat> mechanically stabilized earth berm. And with this berm, we elected to go a little different. I don't know if anybody else <laughs> has done this, but it's the first in the area where we're using a geotextile as the facing. And the reason we, we decided to give this a try was that now that we're 10 plus years into our first MSE wall, we've had to do maintenance twice to, to cut trees off of it. So that's an expense. And then we our second wall, which faces west, we had challenges keeping the grass growing on it. And we had to constantly reseed it and, and do some things like that. So we wanted to give this a try. And then you can just see uh, from the side there, that's uh, our solar panels on the closed landfill. Yes, and this you can see is at the toe of that. And actually SCS engineers helped us with the uh, expansion uh, of a previous cell that, and again, many of these ideas uh, were not ours, but we borrowed them from others. And, and this was one that we borrowed from uh, New Hampshire in that we have uh, five or so looped pipes. Um, this landfill cell is a piggyback on top of an old landfill. So these pipes were embedded in the old landfill underneath the new cell. And the design is to bring some of the heat from the landfill system out into what we hope to build this year is, is a greenhouse. So in the winter, we'll be able to keep the greenhouse going with the heat uh, derived from, from the landfill. And then this, this slide is um, a schematic of the three-stage reverse osmosis system. And one of the reasons we decided to go this direction, we've been wrestling for years, as many do. What's the best way to treat your leachate? It, it's a real challenge. And we went back and forth, various systems. We originally had a sequential batch reactor, reactor which um, was not insulated for the winter. And, and that was replaced by a small RO system that was really a pilot plant. And so we kind of worked out some of the concerns with that. And I think PFOS was one of the driving forces because we have a two mile discharge pipeline to a local stream. It, it's not a high quality stream, but it's a pretty good stream. They stock it with trout every year. And uh, we didn't want to get to the point where we were not able to, to discharge. We, we had truck leachate for years and still truck a little bit. And that's an expense. And you're also at the mercy of others. We, we had one of the lo local large POTWs um, stop accepting leachate and that, that's a real shock. So that was a driving force. And we, we currently have about 25% um, of our leachate, you know, we're doing around a million gallons a month. And uh, so we have about a quarter million that becomes concentrate. And currently we're recirculating most of that back into some of the landfills. Okay, and this is a picture, a, a bit of a yin and yang of our facility. We have uh, installed uh, in three phases now, some artificial turf 
on sections of our landfill. And this is a, the green artificial turf is a south facing slope. And over a year ago, we put out a RFP for someone to develop this slope uh, with a solar panel system. And I just heard today that um, they are moving ahead with that project. So excited about that. And why I say yin and yang, um, this side, besides being, uh, we think, very good for solar development, in that uh, the, the folks that see the landfill, of course, we're on top of uh, a 900 foot area in southeastern Pennsylvania. So those folks uh, that see this have not been um, against having something that wasn't uh, natural. Whereas the other side, the north side, uh, that community wants us to blend in as much as we can with the natural hillside. And, and I'll get into some of that a little bit more, but we have a permit for the north side for natural succession. So we, we don't mow the north side. And I have a, a photo later on shows how that um, blends in. And on the top there is a, um, we, we have a, a little bit of a gazebo type thing that uh, we have picnic tables we're gonna put under. We, we've had one of these for over 20 years in various top parts of the landfill as a scenic overlook. And, and now we have two of these uh, structures as, as part of our Sunday afternoon. So we open the landfill to the public um, Sunday afternoons from one to five, May through October. And uh, folks can come in and uh, actually have picnic lunches or, or other things, fly kites. Uh, we have numerous activities. Um, we have paragliders and uh, others. Yes, and we, we do have a large local plane community. And uh, here's just a picture of some folks. Uh, we, and we have, uh, these are binoculars that are free to the public. And we have uh, uh, three or four of these uh, available at our scenic overlook. And I just wanted to show some of the uh, nice uh, scenery of uh, Lancaster County with, with farms and, and businesses and other uh, hillsides that are still covered in, in trees. And this is the photo I was referring to. This is a, a picture from what used to be the elementary school's parking lot. They've since eliminated this elementary school and it's become a township park. But this is what the, the folks see. And the lower part of this picture, um, I know one tree is very close, but there are other hardwood trees that are in the lower part of the slope, which is the natural slope. And that was the big concern that we would um, blend in better with the uh, hardwood trees. And as you can see, by not mowing the grass, we have uh, some mugwort and some other uh, weeds that grow in and actually uh, help us uh, blend in much better. On the right side, you, you can see part of our scenic overlook. We also have a uh, repeater tower there for our radios and equipment. And then on the uh, on the left side of the photo, if you look closely between the wires there, that's actually our maintenance building. And we have um, planted trees there, some of them over evergreen, so that this time of the year in the winter, that uh, that building is uh, being secluded from, uh, from town. And that's been very popular that one of the things uh, 23 years ago, uh, Locals were complaining about seeing that building and seeing the lights on the building. We, we have since gone to uh, shutting the lights off at night and uh, putting the, the trees around the building and that's worked very well. And uh, we do have a nature trail. It's about six miles uh, round trip. And this is the beginning for the folks that are more adventurous and there's a little bit of a hill to walk up and <clears throat> trail can walk to the very top of the landfill. And just a, a trail map is, is available. It's on our website and, and we hand those out so people don't get lost. And we also for over 20 years have had uh, livestock grazing on parts of our landfills. And currently we have uh, sheep and goats. 
Thank you. And some projects we're working on actually with uh, someone at uh, local SCS is a disc golf person. And uh, we've begun to lay out, uh, they have begun to lay out a nine hole disc golf course in some of the wooded area. We have uh, received a permit and we have some of the site work done for a permanent household hazardous waste and e waste collection facility. And uh, we are soon to be awarding the construction of final capping another five acres of, uh, of our um, exposed uh, membrane cap. So um, turf cap, please. Thank you. And I just thought I couldn't do a landfill presentation without seeing an active work phase. So here's a 86 <clears throat> compactor at work in our, our newest cell. Wonderful. Thank you, Bob. Thanks for the, the deep insights. It, it clearly shows that you know, it's a combination of trying to convert what you have using uh, renewable energy, but also having the livestock and making it accessible. Uh, a couple of questions that came through as, as you were presenting. I think in your early on slides, you showed the, the wall. So the question was, how long was the wall? Yeah, so most of our a um, couple thousand feet long. And uh, our highest wall is uh, 62 feet high. Uh, I think that one averages um, in the 40 foot high range. Yeah. Okay, cool, thank you. And then just kind of moving on, the next question was, what was the slope of the, the solar area? Yeah, that's a relatively flat top. So that one was, was easy and that's why it was done first that it was sized to, to we, we buy the power off of them so they could do better than selling it to the local utility. Um, mm -hmm. So that top is like a 5% slope. So it's relatively flat. Okay, interesting. Um, and then uh, we have a question. It is more of a numbers. Um, do we have any capital or operational numbers for the three-stage RO um, system treating for leachate? And what was the cost per gallon for offsite disposal? Yes. Yeah. So I can, uh, if they're asking trucking, and we have to truck um, to the next county, and for offsite disposal, trucking and disposal cost, I, I believe are around seven, seven cents a gallon. So that really isn't too bad for that. Yeah. Um, capital cost for the, the plant, uh, testing my memory a little bit, but uh, you could send me an email, but I think it's uh, 1.2 million net at ballpark. Yeah. So I think the capacity is, I think uh, rated 45,000 gallons a day. Um, and I think we're averaging in the 30,000 gallon a day uh, range right now. Awesome. Wonderful. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, well, I'll tell that, you know, one quick question I had was in, in a bigger scheme of things, as you're seeing, you know, sustainability is the name of the game now, but from a county perspective, you know, obviously the one example which you gave where you're working with the neighborhoods, um, but from a, a financial perspective, how is the county trying to leverage some of the new policies you know, the Inflation Reduction Act and the infrastructure bill or anything specific to the state of Pennsylvania. Do you have any insights on that? And, and we're sort of a division of the county. So uh, we do work with the county sustainability coordinator and local environmental groups with the municipalities. But um, they, they are awarding um, some of that money to, to folks for um, various things from, from mental health to yeah. land preservation. So we're not really involved. So we're, we're not getting any of the money either. <laughs> not, and, not directly. And we, we actually applied for money for, um, uh, one of the things was a study uh, because we think, uh, we have some interest from some developers of anaerobic digestion also. Um, but we didn't get that grant, but we we may be doing 
looking at something with anaerobic digestion. Interesting. Yeah, you know, I, in a bigger scheme of things, that's kind of spread out all over. And then as the money starts funneling, you know, it, it's been assigned to different different elements, um, especially, you know, renewable energy and things as such. So I was just wondering how, how the county is working towards that. But thank you so much. Um, but just have a minute. We are doing grants ourselves to local municipalities. Mm -hmm. And one of the things, we're doing zero waste grants to, to try to fund some things. We, we funded some uh, um, bag bands and some containers for food um, takeout. And mm -hmm. we also are um, promoting, this is a new thing, we're trying to get the majority of our municipalities, and we have 73 in the county, majority of them use uh, subscription surface, so service from pickup collection. So many municipalities have three to six haulers in their municipality every week. and we're trying to incentivize them to do a single hauler to reduce the environmental impacts of the collection part of waste. Gotcha. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bob. Thanks, thanks for uh, sharing your uh, background and insights. Um, just kind of moving on from a public sector to private, I want to move on to uh, Jesus. Uh, as, as I mentioned, Jesus is part of Republic and He's uh, willing to share some of his background experience and how Republic has been uh, you know, helping sustainability um, in, in the space of uh, waste management. Jesus, over to you. Awesome, thank you. And uh, good morning or good afternoon, depending on where you're at in the country. Um, today, I'll be talking a little bit about organics, a little bit about uh, California regulations, specifically 13, uh, SB 1383. And then a little bit about the implementation of some of the infrastructure we've built to you know, meet the sustainability goals of not only California, but also our local jurisdictions who happen to be our, our customers. This first slide you see up on, on the uh, screen there, that kind of just covers all our infrastructure across the nation. As you can see, uh, many of them, many of our organics operations are in California or, and or Oregon. And we are one of the largest in the space or, or trying to be a little bit bigger in that space just because of the demand. So in California, we compost about 200 tons per day. Um, and just to kind of touch a little bit about the organics operations, we, we, we operate 12 compost uh, facilities and we also partner up with uh, third party com compost uh, partners. And then here in California specifically, we are now operating uh, three operational commercial food waste pre-processing operations. And those numbers is growing. And, and if you go over to the next slide, I'll kind of, oh, sorry, you're on it already. Um, the, this slide here kind of talks about what's driving uh, the demand for some of the facilities that uh, we're building. So if you, if you show, if you see the slide, there's a huge change in regulation when you look back 20 years. Um, you start off by just the solid green there. That's the landfill yard debris brands in those states. Then the green kind of hash or shaded is the landfill yard debris ban with the exemption of landfill landfills with gas collections. And then you look at the orange, that's food scrap collection mandates or legislation keeping food out of landfills. And then finally, the, the blue state, that's California, and that's where we talk about SB 1383, which is a, you know, really a statewide aggressive organics diversion mandates that has fines and penalties, and, and it requires uh, uh, food and green waste to be diverted at nearly every home and business in California. Uh, the goal for California, I think, is, is to divert 50 million tons by, of organics by 2025. All right, so let's talk a little bit about commercial food waste. Um, I like to show this uh, slide because it shows what the waste stream actually looks like. It's very contaminated, it's challenging to process and, and recycle. And I think unfortunately, as, as we start asking more people and more to do this, more customers to do this, it's, it's gonna get harder and harder to figure out how to uh, uh, process it and recycle it. Customers like to place their uh, food waste in bags to minimize odors, vectors, and then you know keep it at their container clean. And it's understandably so. No one wants to uh, deal with 
either of those odors, vectors, or 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 uh, just a dirty bin. So, what are we doing about it? All right. So, what what is Republic Services doing about it? So, one one of the um, the processes that we're running is what we call a a megathor. This is uh, utilizing Scott equipment, and it's basically a horizontal mill. It this this uh, piece of equipment does 20 tons per hour, and it removes the contamination. You know the plastic bags. It's very very durable, American made, and we currently have an operation in Anaheim, Sacramento, and in the Bay Area, which is, for those of you that are not familiar with California, it's the San Francisco, Northern California. And so uh, these operations, once uh, they go through the process, they send the, the clean food waste to a compost facility or an anaerobic digester to generate renewable energy. I think the next slide here is a video of the uh, process, and we can show that. You can kind of see the loader loading the uh, material into the uh, door unit. As it goes in there, it really, really starts pulverizing organic material. And then as it's pulverizing it, it turns it into that like, oatmeal looking material in that box and bin. And then that section there shows how it's separating the uh, contaminants. So our cameraman wanted just to get a real close up of the material. You can see that it, it almost looks like a paste, a material. Um, and again, th that goes to a, an anaerobic, anaerobic digester for, um, for uh, you know, creating energy. So what's another method that we're, uh, we're, we're dealing with organics? We have conventional composting. And this uh, image is here is just traditional windrow composting. Um, we have about six windrow compost facilities. And the way these work, these facilities receive feedstock, they grind the feedstock, then we add water, then we compost the material at 131 degrees Fahrenheit for 15 days. And then we utilize a turner to mechanically add oxygen. And those are the two pieces of equipment that you see in the middle. And then at the very end of it, the process, we screen the finished product. So take note of the 15 days and we'll see why here in the next slide. All right, so the image here is the uh, anaerobic uh, static pile composting. Uh, this is a little more advanced style of composting, and we also have uh, um, a couple of these across California. The difference in the way these run, um, you know, the beginning of it is the same. So as, as we receive the feedstock, we grind the feedstock, we add water, and then we compost the material at 131 degrees uh, uh, Fahrenheit. But the big difference here that this process takes three days. And also the way we introduce oxygen to it, it's aeration fans. And they're like blowers. If you can imagine like the jumping, uh, you know, the jumpers for kids, they're just industrial blowers blowing uh, air through the HDP pipe at the bottom of the pile. And then what we do is we use a biofilter that's a gore technology to, to seal the pile. And that helps it from, you know, the odors and other uh, nuisance. And at the very end, we screen the product um, as well. The good thing about this, uh, um, this type of composting, it's a smaller footprint and it takes about uh, you know, three or four times faster than conventional composting or, or regular composting. So, you know, as we try to meet the regulations and stuff like that, it, 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 I really like to say it takes a team to accomplish great things. And we'll talk about this particular project here in a little bit, but our OTI team um, is one of the best. And it, it not only compromise of Republic employees, so we have a great local operations teams, but we also had a great group of consultants that worked with us. Um, we had sustainable generation, 
Uh, we had the Gore Technologies, HDR, and of course, SCS, who really helped us design and permit um, this, this facility, which we'll present next, but they were along uh, through the whole process. And so just share this uh, video, it's about a three minute video, but it really gives uh, a good background of, of the composting operation down here in Southern California in Chula Vista. Hi, I'm Chris Cini, Director of Organics Operations here at Republic Services. We'd like to welcome you to the grand opening of our Otay Compost Facility in Chula Vista, California. Today is an exciting day for all of us at Republic. We're recycling food and yard waste from the city of Chula Vista and our customers in San Diego County and turning it into compost. Republic Services owns and operates 12 compost facilities across the country, but this site is very unique. The Otay Compost Facility is the first solar-powered compost facility in the state of California. And this facility is the first of its kind, completely solar-powered, off-the-grid sort of compost facility to handle or organic waste, which is green waste and food waste uh, for the, uh, the county of San Diego, the city of Chula Vista, and really Southern California in general. Um, this is on the journey of Republic Services' commitment to sustainability and how we wanna be America's uh, su sustainability partner. And in this particular region, it's infrastructure poor as it relates to dealing with organic materials. And we feel like this investment here, right here in Chula Vista, right here in Southern County, San Diego, is gonna be great for the community, the residents, and it's gonna provide a vital outlet uh, for this organic material for years to come. This particular site uh, can handle uh, currently 100 tons a day, and it will handle up to 200 tons a day uh, when it's at full capacity. That's about 60,000 tons of organic materials a year, and we think it'll serve uh, San Diego and Chula Vista uh, for many years to come. This composting facility will help the city of Chula Vista comply with new food and organic waste collection regulations. We can now process food and yard waste from Chula Vista homes and businesses into rich soil amending compost that we, we can use in our homes or provide to the agricultural industry. Keeping food and yard waste out of the landfill also helps the city of Chula Vista meet our climate action goals. This facility is so vitally important to really helping the state deal with our battle against climate change. This facility is gonna be critical to this region of the state in being able to process food waste and green waste and turn that into important new products like new uh, compost that can be used to, to benefit and strengthen our soils. All of that you know, is so vitally important to dealing with the climate crisis and so this facility is so important to that endeavor. And we're really grateful to Republic Services for investing in this facility and playing such an important role in this region. This, this facility and others across the state are going to help us in dealing with our climate challenge. Republic Services continues to invest in organics infrastructure like the Otay Compost Facility across the state. We know energy independence is important to the San Diego region, and we're proud that the Otay facility operates completely off the grid. This is one of many ways Republic Services is providing sustainable solutions to our customers in Chula Vista and across California. I think, uh, you know, we can probably skip the next couple of slides, but just to close off my presentation here, um, just want to highlight a couple of things. You know, the permitting process for this, if anybody's looking to this, is very lengthy. The picture you see here um, is our pilot program. And this started maybe about five, six years ago. It was easier to do a pilot than get the uh, in, uh, entire pro, uh, program permitted. But you know, if you're looking at it, start as soon, especially if you're in the state of California. The other thing I'd like to mention is the great partnerships that we had. In the video, you see that it was, you know, I mentioned SES and all the other consultants, but this was also a partnership with our enforcement agency or the state regulate, um, regulate, regulators, Cal Recycle, and then our local jurisdiction. You saw the mayor of City of Chula Vista, which you know we partner up with because we definitely want to meet the uh, demands of our customers. I see you played the video, but th this just really shows how you know at the infancy stages of our project, um, where it was just a, a very small pilot program. Um, the, the, the piles are probably a third of the size that they are now. Um, at that point, I think we were doing 50 tons uh, per week. Um, now we're doing up to 300 tons per day. 
So um, again, I'd like to just thank everybody for, for uh, listening and tuning in. If you guys have any questions for me, feel free. Wonderful. <clears throat> thank you, Jesus. Thanks for that uh, insight. Clearly shows, uh, you know, the, the leaps companies like Republic Services are taken, not just on the composting side, but the example that you gave, which is using renewable energy as a part of the whole uh, you know, component of it. That clearly shows that one, you want to be energy independent, which is again, fighting, working towards climate change, but also, you know, the, the core business, which is uh, your con uh, solid waste and composting. One uh, technical question that came through was, uh, you know, early on the first video, which you showed with the uh, new equipment is how much water did you add uh, as a part of the process? Very good question. I, I, I don't, probably can't tell you the exact number of water we use. What I can tell you is that one, we used uh, recycled water. Two, we're looking okay. at other ways to kind of harvest the stormwater that that we keep on site um, to, to use the composting. With the with the gore technology, you use a lot less water um, than the conventional composting. And then what, what I kind of didn't mention too, that, that gore technology allows us to remotely monitor temperatures, moisture um, from basically our cell phones. Oh, interesting. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, just kind of taking a step back from a Republic Services perspective, just want to get an idea um, what's the overall sustainability planning you know, outside of some of the examples which you gave? And one thing about sustainability we see is it cuts across you know, different groups, different departments and different divisions, right? Can you highlight some of the you know, challenges or some of the work that's being done within Republic? Well, as far as challenges, I think you know, that's probably state by state basis, but here in California, is just working through the permitting process and approval process. There's also, you know, the the financial piece. Um, when you're making big changes like this, uh, you got to plan ahead. Um, with this particular project, uh, we work with the state to to uh, acquire some grants that helped us. And and again, I think you saw heard in the video this area is infrastructure poor, but the regulation is a high demand, so that helped us out. And then as a company, you know. I'm probably not the best to talk about it, but I can tell you that, you know, being an employee of it, I just see a lot of cool stuff happening. You hear a lot of stuff in the news. You talk about the electric fleet, um, landfill gas to energy plants, and then projects like this that are meeting the uh, sustainability demand. Yeah. Actually, to that point, I did get a chance to look at your uh, sustainability report on your website. And yeah, not just on the environmental side, I see there's a lot of work and you know, progress being done on the social and the governance side also of the ESG framework. And you know, the report itself, pretty detailed report that kind of gives an idea how companies are, uh, like Republic are, are you know, leading this fight towards uh, climate, but also ensuring that you know, the day-to-day -day business continues on. Thank you, Aziz. Thank you so much for uh, uh, sharing your experience and, and insights. Just moving on, I um, want to bring in Tim. Uh, as I introduced, Tim is uh, part of SWANA, the organization. Um, Tim, again, this is more of, uh, uh, I would say, Q&A session. Just want to get an idea, as I mentioned to you early on, right? This is time is in a essence. If you see companies are publishing their roadmap to net zero, but also figuring out or, or trying to realize what are the challenges there. So what are you seeing uh, within SWANA as a part of your network? What is that the companies are doing towards net zero, uh, roadmap to net zero? Well, thanks. Thanks to the panelists, to some great examples there and to the folks on the call. So what SWANA is really doing, I'm speaking as the SWANA president, is we're a resource. We're, we're here to help uh, coalesce and organize some of these strategies you've heard, uh, I, you've heard identified this morning. Uh, our climate change is part of our strategic plan that uh, we have uh, launched from 20, our five-year plan from 2023 to 2027 focuses on climate change as one of the key drivers in our industry with an emphasis on our advocacy, 
and and our education. You know, we've gone farther in our goal than where we were four years ago. You heard that mention that you know this is an evolving uh, field for us. So SWANA and through its chapters, forty seven chapters, uh, both in the United States, Canada. Uh, Puerto Rico, the Western Pacific, we cover a large swath of territory. We're advocating at the national, the state, local level, and we're trying to drive process changes that lead uh, to a local economy. And I think one of the things that I can mention from my past experience in both the private and public sector is mm -hmm. what we see in SWANA moving forward is the utilization of public-private partnerships to help bring these types of processes, these types of facilities online. You can get to them quicker. You can leverage your assets that you have, whether it's land, whether it's finance, whether it's technology, whether it's expertise, and bring those together faster. And that's where we're real driving the change on how quickly can we pivot and emphasize our role in this industry as as climate change protectors. Wonderful, and I think that's the key, as as you rightly mentioned, is the public private partnerships. This is not just in you know, one company or one organization. Um, not not a driver just from a policy perspective, as you've seen, and I'm sure you know most of the industry is recognizing now that as the younger generation is coming in as as a part of the workforce. There, uh, one of the intents and the, and the requirements is what are companies doing towards climate change? What are companies doing uh, towards uh, sustainability? So, as I mentioned, having that public-private partnerships is key, sharing the solutions, sharing the data, sharing the information, um, but also is, is, is relevant to what, what we're doing at this point. Uh, you did mention that Twana has potential for IT and, you know, as part of your member organizations. Can you highlight some of the you know, key uh, examples as what SWAN is doing towards sharing what is sustainability, building a network, and also um, kind of dissipating that to the member network? Well, one of, one of the best examples that we have, SWAN has seven technical divisions in different areas of expertise, ranging from, and you have some of the panelists on this call here that have been some of the technical directors in landfill, landfill management, landfill gas. I was the technical director for the sustainable materials management technical division. So you can organize yourself around your area of interest or, or expertise in, in SWANA through the technical divisions. We have training programs that we've been uh, having to pivot through COVID to go all online, uh, yeah. but it has also helped strengthen sort of our, our training platform so that we can do more training in more locations. We also uh, support you know, in-person training so you can network with some of your fellow operators across a number of uh, strategies. Uh, a few years ago, SWANA partnered with the state, uh, the local state recycling association, the California Resource Recovery Association, to bring forward a zero waste certification class. Uh, that was a pretty dynamic change for SWANA to be in the space of advocating for programs around zero waste and trainings for zero waste and sustainability and how they link up. You saw two good examples here of folks utilizing sustainable energy on their projects, in their facilities to, to make that happen. On the advocacy front, I would say SWAN has taken a strong lead, is developing along with the EPA, the uh, recycling partnership approach in terms of seeing uh, a significant amount of funding, which has never been at the federal level before, to advocate for recycling and, and recycling grants. Uh, another key area that uh, I've been fortunate enough to participate in is any of us that run collection fleets or have run collection fleets in the past or run uh, solid waste handling facilities or recycling centers, the danger around lithium ion batteries is yeah. there is a battery task force that, that I'm on. Uh, SWANA just hosted <clears throat> along with ISRI, the, inter, um, the Scrap and Recycling Institute, uh, a 
call, I think we had close to a thousand people on the Zoom call. More importantly, we had two sitting United States senators on this call looking to enact legislation <coughs> on extended producer responsibility and keeping our workplace safe so that we don't have uh, a tragic incident around lithium ion batteries. So we're just really excited around where we are in the place of advocacy and training and safety that sustains our climate action work. That's impressive. And I think that's that's the whole intent behind you know discussions like this is how the organizations like Swana, public companies, private, and you know, companies like SCS can help work uh, you know, one central goal, one main goal. Yeah. Thanks, Tim. Thanks for uh, your insights in Swana and uh, and the strategic plan is on our website, so I'd urge folks from the call to download that, go to swana.org. You can see the whole breakdown of the strategic plan there. Exactly, and that, that is something which I always been advocating folks is, you know, go on the website, whether it is, you know, organizations or individual companies, they do have their climate action plans, they do have their sustainability uh, reports published that gives an idea you know how this is being driven internally thank you so much thanks for the insights um last but not least i do want to jump on to pat pat sullivan as i mentioned he's the senior vp here at scs comes in with tons of uh, experience background in this space a uh, few things Pat. i just want to ask you was in a bigger scheme of things uh, what do you think? How are the solid waste uh, companies uh, working towards sustainability? I know we saw a good example from Republic, but you know, based on your experience at SCS, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, sure. Um, first, let's look at the larger waste companies, which Jesus is part of. And, and as you noted, Ajay, that many of those have very, very formal uh, sustainability ESG type programs. They've published their reports. They've set and established goals for themselves, and they've had multiple years of working, working towards those goals. As we get into some of the smaller uh, regional waste companies, we see not quite the, you know, the level of detail and sophistication. Some do have formal programs and are, are certainly yeah. doing similar things. Others are more in their they're just getting started. Uh, some just have sustainability policies that they they have established and they haven't yet got a formalized program and haven't published formal sustainability or ESG reports. Um, I think they're all going to get there and to some degree. But we do see as an evolution, if you look at the first year of even Republic's report as an example, to where it is today, it, it's evolved significantly. They over time, more components are added. They may be started with one focus, and then now it's it's a comprehensive you know ESG program that not only touches on the the E part, which is what we're mostly talking about here, but also the social and governance parts are are there as well. And I think you'll see again more and more of the you know the waste industry that that are moving there. Um, if you go through the the programs that are out there for these waste companies. Um, you'll see different, very common components. And this is true of a lot of sustainability programs. Climate change has always seemed to be one of the top ones. I don't know that I've seen one that doesn't cover it. Uh, yeah. Usually carbon footprint, setting a baseline and establishing some goals. And Re Republic has a very uh, robust uh, element yeah. in that regard, as well as some very aggressive goals that they've set for themselves to meet. So that's that's very common, the, the climate Piece is always there. Uh, we also see recycling, obviously very well represented. Number one, it's part of the way they can get to some of their greenhouse gas reductions, such as you know, organics diversion, but also the, the broader circular economy and, and, and um, being a major player in that uh, and how we manage those wastes and in some cases stop them becoming waste in the first place. So you'll see that very well represented, and then um, renewable energy. Um, yeah. That's landfill mm -hmm. gas to energy, whether that's biogas from anaerobic digestion, digestion or whatever it is, looking at ways to uh, um, both reduce greenhouse gas emissions, reduce other emissions, as well as simply 
you know, decrease our reliance on fossil fuels. So that'll be another big part. And then finally, they all have major fleets of vehicles. So yeah. that has got always going to be a, a big component for them, both in, in the greenhouse gas front, but again, in their energy use, et cetera. So fleet conversion, starting to use uh, less diesel, um, starting mm -hmm. to even consider hybrids and electric. And, yeah. um, and again, you'll see that continued transformation of the solid waste fleets both the heavy equipment as well as the refuse hauling trucks uh, over time. And, and, and they've all identified that as a key area. So I think that's what you're going to see. And then I think you're going to see even some of the smaller regional and even local waste companies, even just local haulers, we're going to are going to get into the same game and, and, um, and play so, maybe catching up to, uh, to where the major waste companies are. So, and then as you rightly said, there's different components, right? There's recycling, there's fleet, then obviously there's something that's, uh, you know, in-house, but from an ESG framework, the environment or the E aspect of it is, is, is uh, has been the main focus. Uh, just to your point in regards to the greenhouse gas, and I'm sure uh, Republic and even, you know, Bob's organization might relate to some of it is, the technology component of it, right? How do you even do the baseline? Where are we today? How do you set up those goals? The science-based targets or, you know, what are the reporting standards? That is something that has been happening in the industry, but where we are or what, you know, companies like SCS will be able to do is help companies, help organizations work more on the downstream side of it. Yes, you have set up your goals. Yes, you have identified your milestones and timelines, but now you have to go actually go execute that. Uh, and I would say, you know, next few years, the next decade is that's where most of the churn and most of the work is going to happen. What are the, that's what a are great, the, that, hey, I just to add to that, Dajay, that we've had some entities, and I won't name any names, but that have had to adjust their goals because they realize initially they set okay. goals. And then as you get into it, it can, it can be more difficult than you think in the solid waste world. Landfill methane is just such a major contributor, such a large chunk of the, the greenhouse gas emissions from a, any solid waste center. And that includes the municipalities as well, um, that trying to achieve reductions there, which can be difficult if you're still a growing company. As you're achieving organic growth, how do you meet your company-wide goals as long as you're continuing to use, you know, use and dispose waste in landfills? So that's something that I think a lot of entities have discovered and, and it's something we're going to continue to grapple with going forward is how do we achieve those methane reductions because they're such a big component. And we've seen it even in municipalities who, who of course, the municipality is much greater than their solid waste uh, department. They have a lot more things going on, but even in that, where you have a more broad uh, organization, uh, the solid waste and landfill and greenhouse gas can still be a major component even of their overall. So that is something that I think everyone is discovering and uh, and, and 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 they all know it and they're all focused on it. Yeah. So I, I, I'm, I'm confident we're going to be making some progress. But your point is taken that once you get down to brass tacks and actually have to implement things and reduce things that sometimes the goal, the goals were a little more aggressive initially than they and then you could meet and there's some things that, you know, obstacles that pop up along the way. And organic growth is one of those because we all want to grow, right? We all want to grow our businesses. But if you've set a baseline based on a certain year and now you're five years okay. later and you had significant organic growth, even if you achieved other reductions, you still can might struggle to meet that reduction goal you set for yourself. So, uh, you know, it can be tricky to balance growth along with greenhouse gas reduction. And the same goes for energy reductions, water usage, all the other components of the uh, of a broad sustainability program are difficult sometimes to meet goals when you're growing. So, Well, you know, the, the, the discussion in the industry is it's not like it's a changing target, but it's a changing roadmap. You know, milestones change, but your target still remains the same. Yeah. And I'll be right on that. Uh, it's uh, an hour. Uh, one thing I do want to close out on was, uh, you know, obviously as we think about sustainability, there is the the you know actual climate component of it where you're trying to reduce our greenhouse gas. Obviously, there's a financial component of it, whether 
you know, uh, there's, there's a need from either the organizations or from our government. But one thing I'm seeing is, you know, as we start recruiting, one of the key, um, I would say the questions that come up is, what is the company doing towards sustainability, especially from the younger generation, the Gen Zs of the world, you know, as they come in into the workforce. So that is also a, a, a driver or a requirement for companies to start focusing on and you know working towards uh, sustainability. Again, I do thank the panel. Thank you for all your insights. Uh, very educational, very inspirational, and hoping we'll take this and move on to the next stage and make this a better world. Thank you all. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Appreciate Ajay. Bye. Thank you, attendees. We appreciate your time today.